the director of coffee and sales there. And we're happy to be here with you guys. Uh, thanks so much for coming out and letting us have an opportunity to share with you some of our story, uh, some of what's special to us. I think we have that, that some of those things in common. But right now you're enjoying a coffee from Felix Mendaka, a uh, farm that we partner with. It is hopefully the experience is it's delicious coffee. We think it really is. I think you've done a phenomenal job uh, uh, producing that coffee. And that's that first stage in coffee. We're gonna discuss some of the concepts of uh, production, uh, some of the agricultural principles that have been used there. Uh, and that's something I think you guys will find very interesting. Uh, one stage of that process is the production, the growing the harvesting and the washing and the milling and all these things that contribute to the flavor in coffee. Uh, then it gets brought over to the U.S. And then if we don't do something magical in the roasting process, well, then you have a green coffee. There's not too much, too much really happening on that, that side of things. You might not enjoy consuming it. It's kind of vegetal. Um, consider if you were to brew the lawn clippings you had. You know, <laughs> it's not the tastiest uh, the treat when it's just left green. So we have to roast it. So what I wanted to introduce our head roaster, Brian, well, this is Brian. Brian's done some phenomenal stuff with coffee. Uh, he's an award-winning roaster that we brought over from Denver. Uh, he's done some, some great things, and we thought we'd like to have somebody on our team that can treat these types of coffees that might not start off as award-winning coffees, but when you put them in the hands of a, a roaster who has that kind of experience, dedication, and understanding of the roasting process, we're gonna take this coffee from a, a humble farm and elevate it to the experience that it is a special grade of quality coffee. So I'll let Brian talk a little bit about his vision behind that. If you, have, if you do have questions in that roasting process, you can put up your hand, we'll take a couple of questions within that now. Sometimes we say things and words uh, in the roasting process that just aren't super familiar. So if that throws you off a little bit, feel free to shoot up a hand and we'll be happy to say, oh, let me explain that real quick. So Brian, if you tell us a little bit about uh, this coffee, why you roasted it the way you did, and, and maybe what you're hoping that the uh, the people here will experience that. Yeah, sure. So, to begin to speak about roasting, we have to talk about what coffee actually is. And, you know, our culture has generally experienced coffee starting with like Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts or Folgers, and we haven't experienced it as much as an agricultural product, right? So we, a lot of times we see coffee as a uniform product that we buy in a can at the grocery store that should always be the same. In reality, what coffee is, is a shrub that grows cherries in a variety of different microclimates that's much more in the vein of wine. Uh, while that might sound pretentious, it really isn't because every strain or cultivar, which is a type of bean that's been cultivated for flavor or for climate change, Every cultivar has different flavor characteristics, uh, density, size of cherry. So every farmer produces different cultivars and different types of coffee beans on their farm that's suitable for their little microclimate, right? So this coffee that you're tasting is from Peru and it's very high elevation. So if you go and buy Folgers or you buy like a cup of coffee at Starbucks, what you're, what you're generally getting is mass agriculture coffee that's harvested by what they call a, a tornado machine. That is just a machine that goes down rows of coffee shrubs and uses air to blow the cherries off and then is mass harvested. What you're tasting today is one farmer with probably a dozen people harvesting cherries by hand over three days. And what they're looking for is a, a specific ripeness of cherry. So what does that mean for, for what you're gonna taste and for roasting? Basically, you, you're tasting a coffee that after 14 people have handled this coffee, from planting it, to harvesting it, to processing it. So th this is hand harvested coffee picked for ripeness. Then it's processed very carefully to ensure that any underripe cherry, like who's had an underripe black cherry, for instance? We all have, right? Really sour and tart and kind of gross. All those have been removed by hand from the mass of coffee cherries harvested. Uh, great care was taken with this coffee to remove all the underripes, all the bad cherries. So basically this farmer has spent time and hours and labor to remove all the bad cherries, remove all the, the plants that might not taste good. So all this stuff comes to us and we 
what we do when we're roasting is we're going to look at the cleanliness of this lot. If we, so we're, we're excited because the uniformity of the size of the cherry and the ripeness of the cherry. So who, who's baked chocolate chip cookies and used a little piece of dough versus a big piece of dough, right? Have you tried to bake anything where like there's different sizes? And you know what happens, right? You have to bake for the biggest cookie because, and then you burn the little ones, correct? So the nicer the coffee, like this coffee, the more uniform the size. The, the cheaper and more mass produced the coffee, the more variance of size. So if you've tasted coffee that tastes kind of burnt, the reason it, that it's roasted like that is because they have to, because all the sizes and the densities are different. So this is gonna lead into coffee roasting, right? So you, get, you find a farmer that takes such great care to remove the underripe or the overripe cherries to remove all foreign matter. And what, what we're getting is a very uniform sized coffee bean. Uh, so my job as a roaster is to say, hey, we have this beautifully prepared coffee cherry seeds, which is what coffee is. And my job is to make those, those seeds taste delicious. So let's define what a delicious, well-roasted coffee is. In my opinion, a delicious, well-roasted coffee is sweet and balanced and has body. So what is body? Who's been to a wine tasting and you've done the swirl with a glass of red wine and you've seen that wine just drip down the sides of your glass, right? That's body. And it's, a well-roasted coffee will have that body. So if you drink the coffee and it stays on your palate and coats your palate with sugars, that's an indication of a well-roasted coffee. If you taste coffee and it doesn't need sweetener because it's kind of naturally sweet, that means it's a well-roasted coffee. If you taste a coffee that is sour or vegetal, that means it's not well roasted, right? So we're trying to avoid sour, we're trying to make it sweet, we're trying to have a really nice mouth coating body. And with a farmer like Felix, who's sp spent so much time on the agricultural side to, to mill and prepare this coffee so it's uniform, my job's a lot easier because I'm not dealing with tiny beans and big beans and underripe cherries that taste sour. I'm dealing with someone who's taken great time and care to make all these beans, to pick them when they're perfectly ripe. They're all the same size. So it makes my job a lot easier. So what I do when I'm roasting coffee is we get a little sample from these farms before they're sent across the ocean to us, okay? It's about 100 grams of, of cherry. And what we do is we sample roast it, and we do it not to taste good, but just to analyze both the good and the bad qualities of this said coffee. When we tasted this coffee, the sample, before it was sent across the country, to be honest, it was a little boring. It was uh, very nutty and kind of flat. So, but we wanted to work with this farmer because it's been multiple years and we believed in the coffee. So we went ahead and bought it anyway. And we did about three roasts where I was trying different approaches. Basically, a coffee roaster, if you can imagine, it's like 1800s technology, right? We have a huge spinning metal drum over flame with a fan. So like you, you could build one of these in your backyard if you have mechanical, uh, if you have mechanical knowledge. So the, the technology is old and the, the amount of variables are, you know, they're, they're myriad, but in reality you have heat and you have airflow and you have the amount of coffee in this big rotating drum. So my goal with this particular coffee was to elevate kind of the, the boring nuttiness. I wanted to bring out a little bit more of the citric acidity that was in there. And I wanted to bring up the body to where it was kind of creamy like marzipan. And I wanted to make the natural sweetness highlighted. So uh, as a coffee roaster, the first thing I did was I tried a small batch with a lot of airflow. So imagine cooking a loaf of bread with convective heat. You know, the convective heat with a lot of air in your oven sometimes can take something that's dense and get that heat into the middle of, of whatever you're cooking and cook it evenly. When we tasted that high airflow roast of this coffee, it was bad and I thought maybe I should quit and like, you know, go do something else. So, abandon ship. The next thing I did was try a smaller batch with a lot more uh, conductive heat or a lot more basically gas flame with 
very, very restricted airflow, like a whisper of air with high, with high gas. And what we found when I took that approach was that that sweetness that was kind of missing from too much airflow, that sweetness was there, right? And while it didn't have the body we were looking for, I was very happy with the sweetness and the amount of acidity present from just the convective heat and the drum without much air pushing through. So, I am a perfectionist uh, to my own detriment sometimes, so I decided to take another couple of approaches. And what I found was that for the first part of the roast, when I'm drying the, the actual coffee cherry out, no airflow, but a lot, of, a lot of gas allowed that coffee to dry very gently because it wasn't too much air drying the coffee out. So what I did was I did very little air during the first part of the roast. And then who, who here is ground onions in a cast iron pan? Anyone's caramelized onions, right? So you know when you're caramelizing onions, you're, what you're trying to do is make those onions sweet, right? Coffee is very similar. And who here has burnt onions or tried to make their own caramel and cooked it too hot and burnt it, right? Less hands, look at that, less hands. Yeah, less hands. Everyone's ashamed, everyone's ashamed. So, this is, sidebar, this is why coffee roasters generally don't like dark roast. If you've ever dehydrated or burnt caramel in a pan, that's what dark roast coffee is. You've dehydrated sugars and you've burnt these sugars, right? So, um, with this particular coffee, I was trying to maximize that sugar caramelization, right? This is my favorite thing about coffee, is you can roast it well and have it be sweet, and you don't need to mess with cream and sugar. So, I took this really, basically zero air approach for the first half, then when I wanted to start browning these sugars present in this coffee seed, I increased the air and really took the heat almost all the way off to extend the sugar browning phase. I was trying to make caramel, in this coffee roaster, right? So, I extended this sugar browning phase as, we, as in the coffee roasting, that's what we term, we call the mailier phase, because we're turning these acids into sugars. So I increased the air and really elongated that phase of the roast, and I was very, very happy with the result, and I feel like we were able to bring out the sugars that we felt were missing in the first couple of attempts by elongating the mailier phase of coffee roasting. And I feel like I didn't dehydrate the sugars because there's no roast tasting or there's no burnt, there's no burnt flavor in this, in my opinion. So I feel like I was able to develop and brown these sugars in, in this coffee seed without dehydrating and, and over roasting the coffee. So, you know, that's a, that's a very shallow overview of what coffee roasting can do for a coffee and should do for a coffee. Uh, did I miss anything? No, I think that was that was uh, quite extensive and beautiful. Thank right. you very much for explaining that <laughs> and at the depth that I was hoping you would you would just scratch on because th this is the type of perspective that I hope people understand that we take when it comes to these coffees, these producers. You know, what I mean that uh, that there's a lot of dedication, there's science, there's craftsmen, there's artistry. Uh, there's also the going. weight of being in the being a human in a chain of everyone that's taking such care and expense to prepare something yeah. um, like coffee. I mean, being the 13th person to, to, and being responsible for roasting that and presenting it to the public, um, I, I take that very personally and take a lot of honor and pride in that and a lot of pressure. So um, yeah. I just want you guys to all take home that every time you drink coffee, there's been 13 people that put a lot of effort and heart and soul into making that, that beverage for you. And it is just a beverage, but it also is a lot of passion coming coming to you guys. And you know, going to a specialty coffee roaster like Utopian or there's other places, you know, that you've that you've seen around town, there's a lot of people putting their passion behind something like this. So I'd encourage you guys to, you know, consider all the human effort that's gone into these making this, you know, bean water for you guys in the end. Well, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. Yeah, we have a couple questions. We'll, we'll jump in. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Right. So I love uh, I love the passion. I love the year. You feel the weight of, of you know, honoring the, the effort of the people in the previous steps. You said you got the, that sample batch and weren't in love with it, but you were kind of invested in 
that specific farm? How are you guys fighting these people? Well, this particular farm, the owner of Utopian visited, and he actually developed a personal relationship with Felix, and he was kind of struck by his passion and chose to work with him. And there's there's a couple different levels of of companies between someone in Fort Wayne and Peru. Right. So he he was able to work with a company called Origin Coffee Labs who are basically coffee fanatics in Peru that provide market access to specific farmers. So if Felix wouldn't have sold his coffee to us, Felix would have sold his coffee to someone that would take it, would have taken those 100 bags, blended them up with 100 bags from Farmer B, with 100 bags from Farmer C, sold it for way less money to uh, a bigger company. So, you know, we found someone to give access to him and provide us with the infrastructure that we don't know how to do, like international shipping and insurance. So, um, yeah, personal relationship. We found a, a middleman in Peru that was able to handle the stuff that we did, we're not good at and then get, get it to us in the country. So, there's a company in between there that's finding the good people and presenting the good people. Yeah, and well, what, kind of, it, could, it could be that way. I'll, I'll look back this way. Yeah, what often happens, uh, I just spoke with a really a really kind of a genius level farmer in Guatemala that we're going to have some coffees from some climate change resistant coffee. And this farmer, all of his family farms and his friends family farms were decimated by a climate change. Uh, it was called coffee rust and 60 to 70% of their livelihoods were wiped out by climate change induced coffee rust. So what this guy did was like, what are we going to do? So he went back and found heirloom cultivars, which were kind of plants that had been grown in Guatemala for you know the past 80 years and were thriving in said conditions. Sure. Um, and basically, the American market had basically said, "We don't want these cultivars. We don't want these varietals. We want one. We want one monocrop." We're, we're and, and the monocrop. Decimated, got decimated by coffee rust. So with this guy, whose name is Chris Starry, whose coffees we'll have next month, said, okay, so what can we do with these heirloom varietals that are resistant to, to coffee rust? How can we make them good? You know, so they what they what they started to do was take these coffee coffee plants and shrubs that were resistant to climate change, but you know, to be honest, didn't taste great. And what they did was start to manipulate the fermentation process, which happens with the actual cherry of the seed. We taste the seed, right? But there's cherry on there that they have to use fermentation to, to remove. And traditionally, it's been like open, kind of like, imagine a, a, a kind of a crappy swimming pool filled with cherries fermenting. So what these guys said, hey, we're gonna get sophisticated with the fermentation process, adding different acids and different, uh, removing air. Um, what they said is we're gonna take these coffee, the climate change resistant crops, and we're going to use fermentation and manipulate that as a tool to make these coffee plants taste better and give us more access to high-end markets. So, you know, talking to producers like this who are, you know, getting incredibly sophisticated on how to use climate change resistant crops and then manipulate the fermentation or the actual processing of the cherry to provide something that, you know, the American market is willing to pay top dollar for. So, you know, uh, Basically, the question is, yeah, we get in touch with these people through, I read an article about this guy, so I called him. I was like, this guy seems cool. So it's just like, you know, there's so many farmers doing really cool things, and a lot of those farmers doing really cool things will go to the farmers in their community and buy their cherries and kind of elevate the community uh, just because they're, you know, they, they know, they've learned how to do these things. Yeah. They'll buy the infrastructure, they'll have these fancy fermentation tanks, yeah. and then give access to their friends and then all of a sudden, they're the ones dealing with a guy like me buying the coffee. So they're both a farmer and exporter. They're, you know, they're kind of super mature. Like, you know, they're, they're high-end guys. Awesome. We'll get into even some more of those things. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate your story. Any other your questions about roasting coffee? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just wondering how many pounds do you roast at a time? And also, you're experimenting with the roasting. Do you have any rules that you have to roast it or can you put a small batch in the We never waste it. You know, there's, there's, uh, what you end up doing is if a coffee isn't as great as you'd want it to be, you blend 
like five to ten percent of that batch into you know more mainstream blends that aren't sold as a single origin. Uh, the amount of coffee per batch is an artistic choice based on the aesthetic that you're going for. If you have a coffee that you want to be bright and lively, you go for a small batch. If you have a coffee like you know I mentioned cookies like baking cookies and one's this big and one's this big. You know, you have to elongate that roast to allow for the, the big cookie to get cooked at the same rate. So it's a it's a aesthetic choice based on my desired cup characteristic. But there's also uh, just certain roasters hold certain amount of beans. So you know, we have a we have a 25 kilo roaster. You would probably fill that with 60 percent capacity. You know, so 38 pounds. You know, we also have a 70 kilo roaster. You know, so you probably put about 110 pounds in there. If you want to make sure that it's it's getting roast even, there's some machines that they call they start getting big and they start calling it a single bag roaster. A single bag of coffee is 155 pounds, uh, depending on the country that it comes from. So you might call it a single bag or a double bag or a triple bag or a quad bag roaster. Some roasters can do four bags at a time. You know, so it just really depends on the volume and the artistry side of it that Brian's referring to is that portion where we're saying, hey, we don't think that roasting two or three or four entire bags at once is really good for the coffee and can really bring out a lot of great flavor. This mass production uh, really isn't gonna make delicious coffee or honor the farmers or the process or allow the roaster to feel like they're really crafting something because they're just mass producing a particular product. So um, yeah, different sizes and waste. I mean, there's, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, Da Vinci says there will be spilt paint when you're creating a masterpiece. You know what I mean? So uh, to some degree, beans don't get to be utilized the way we, we hope to be utilized. But there's always something that can be done with them. You know, there's always something that uh, we can transfer them into or turn them into something else or it can be donated to someone who might not have as discerning of a palate but just wants caffeine as a means of caffeination. You know, so uh, there's always something to be done with it. But beans by no means just go to the trash can. You know, we kind of make those, different, those choices. So let's jump into the rest of what we're, we're here to discuss as well today. And again, thank you, Brian, for your perspective and knowledge. Um, it goes quite a ways sometimes when we discuss coffee, right? There's just, it's almost, almost endless. There's so many different aspects of, uh, of it and what we can get into it. Uh, Brian was nice enough to give us kind of an overview of the roasting experience without having to dive even deeper into understanding what really is the Meyer reaction? What's actually happening within caramelization? You know, what's the melanoid and how does that affect flavor? You know, these are so much more, you know, granular, you know, kind of concepts on coffee, which we love to talk about. So afterwards we can discuss that even further. What I'm hoping to, to share with you a little bit about is some of the things that are changing within coffee. We just we have a little bit of time left here. Um, as you guys are part of this nature preserve, obviously your heart is in the preservation of nature, right? So something that we found kind of fascinating that we we're, were chatting with the folks here was these new progressive stages in coffee within agriculture altogether, really. Uh, so my hope was to describe a little bit of what's taking place within the world of regenerative coffee. Um, are you guys familiar with regenerative agriculture? Anybody? We got a few people too. With that agroforestry, familiar with that? So same concept. Um, a lot of different attempts have been made uh, within the specialty coffee industry and agriculture altogether to preserve uh, soil health, to preserve uh, the farm, the livelihood, the soil, soil health, uh, the, the ecosystem. That's, that's there. And, you know, Brian brought up you know, a term that, uh, you know, maybe some people aren't familiar with when discussing monocrop. And so monocrop are familiar, make sure we're all in the same, we're all understanding terms. Um, something that we've we realized, experience is that, you know, coffee is always grown as, as a monocrop. And so that is something that can be really challenging to farmers to have one crop you're taking care of, and as Brian mentioned before, experiencing things like this rust that is just eating away uh, the environment. So uh, we've seen this amazing bit where we partnered a lot with different certifications. So there's an importance in certifications. Uh, our roasting facility uh, is organic certified. So meaning that, you know, the way we produce coffee, we can buy from an organic farm, their certified organic farm. Um, and then as a, as a facility, you know, we're certified too. So we take that all the way through the process you know, which is a great certification. I'm, I'm so glad for it. It's done a lot of, a lot of good and a lot of positive. Uh, we are also fair trade certified. So we were able to sell coffees that are fair trade. 
uh, right now working on our regenerative organic certification. So uh, just by next, I think July, we'll have, we'll be the first regenerative organic certified uh, coffee roasting company in the Midwest. So it's something I'm really excited about. Um, I just came from a coffee company where I helped start the first regenerative coffee uh, in the United States. So it's a 100% regenerative coffee company. Uh, we started from the ground up. And that was something I was really passionate about because it's changing so many things. Uh, the reason I like to talk about Regen is just a, a, a personal experience that I've had. I worked, uh, we had, my wife and I were part of a herd share uh, in, in Southern California where I'm from. And we had, uh, there's cows on that farm of course, there was chickens and goats and all kinds of stuff and uh, or apple orchards and there was, uh, I mean just vegetation, you know, produce, it was, it was incredible, you know, during Thanksgiving time, you know, we had the big fat turkeys too, right? So just so much was happening there. And as I got to learn about the farm, I didn't really realize it was a regenerative farm. We just were part of the herd share with the cows and we'd get fresh raw organic milk and we had to milk ourselves. And growing up in the city, you know, that was a pretty new experience for me. You know, uh, you know, we didn't really get out to the out suburb area and, and to the those regions within California that, that allowed this, you know. So you think of Southern California, you don't think of milk and cows typically. Um, but it was just such a unique experience. And as I saw this, this model take place where animals are, you know, walking through, uh, you know, different vegetation and they're eating away little sprouts and sprigs, you know, that are, that are coming up and they're, they are contributing manure, you know, to this, this environment. And I'm thinking, this looks like a mess to me, you know, and look, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird, you know, I'm thinking they're going to destroy stuff and eat things. And, um, and, and the, uh, the owner of the farm there just started to explain a bit more of what's taking place and what's, what's happening. And then I started to study a bit more of the regenerative concept. I realized, oh, this is starting to happen in coffee. And started to realize that there are farms that are on their way. And I'd never heard of that before. And we learned about coffee farms in, in Brazil that were starting to do some of this work. Um, there's a little docu-series. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll get you some notes afterwards. I'm trying to remember the name. They just, they just put it out. But it's a, it's a great um, agroforestry and regenerative uh, farm out there in Brazil, and they're showing how they're really dealing with some harsh situations and, and, and coming through. So the reason I bring the farm I, I, was, I was on it was just the, the produce. Everything tasted amazing. The flavor was tremendous. The things were just, it was just so different, so lively. You know, I remember being able to pull different uh, lettuce and, and radishes and carrots and all kinds of stuff in there, and I didn't need any dressing on anything. The flavor was just so rich. Uh, so when I first got my hands on some regenerative coffees, it was, it, it kind of blew my mind how, how much more flavor these coffees have. But when you start to think about, you know, the, the, the biodiversity there, you start to think about the soil health, and you start to, to learn that these, this is a healthier environment, and it's sequestering this, this, this carbon output, you know, we start to see that it, it's really changing, you know. I was listening to a, a talk where uh, vineyards, there's a vineyard in California that's, that's moving towards its regenerative practices, and they're, they're bringing sheep in uh, to kind of help out and to manage, you know, some of the, uh, the insect, and, and so they're realizing that with even just the urine from the sheep, they don't have to use as much water, you know, that's happening there, and the, the fertilizer, and they're comparing this, this year to the next year, and they're seeing how the flavor is even greater, you know, it's, it's a better flavor, that wine from that year.